the third generation Mini Cooper S is a properly credible hot hatch this time around, rather than merely a very quick but fashionable urban trinket. Its bigger, harder hitting 2 litre engine and a more talented chassis deliver plenty of fun as you power to 62 miles an hour in 6.8 seconds to the tune of a blissfully cheeky exhaust note. It's a more mature thing too, better built than any of its rivals and with more sophisticated underpinnings that are better suited to longer journeys. In short, this car has come of age. The Mini Cooper S has long been an exercise in artful compromise, looking to occupy that sweet spot between the warmish Cooper and the wild race-inspired John Cooper works model. As a result, it's often been the best pick for those who aren't likely to subject their car to a race circuit and instead just want a Mini that's entertainingly quick without incurring huge running costs in the process. That hasn't changed too much with this third generation model, but what lies beneath the skin has. Under the bonnet, you'll find a two litre turbocharged engine that may only have three cylinders, but puts out a 192 brake horsepower total. That's eight brake horsepower up on what went before. More importantly, perhaps we're promised a bigger, better finished car than before, yet one that still seems well priced against comparably performing hot hatch rivals like Peugeot's 208 GTI, Ford's Fiesta ST and the Renault Sport Clio 200. This ought to be many people's ideal expression of go-kart inspired mininess. Is it? Let's find out. So, what's it like? Slip behind the wheel and at first glance quite a lot seems to have changed. The driving position feels a bit less upright, the dashboard is smarter and you aren't faced with quite so many obvious attention seeking gimmicks. That massive dinner plate display that used to house an almost indecipherable speedometer is still there, but it's now simply used for infotainment with the speedo relocated to a pod above the steering wheel. The same wheel that used to completely obscure the slot into which you had to press your ignition key to start the thing. That silly slot's now gone too, replaced instead by a neat starter switch in the middle of the familiar row of toggle switches that have survived at the bottom of the centre stack. Let's flip it and see what we've got. First impressions are positive. Like all the power plants in this third generation new Mini, this one has three cylinders and triples always sound good when you're accelerating away, even if in other cars a lot of them create quite a din. This one doesn't. You'd really have to know your engines to realise that this wasn't a conventional four cylinder unit. But because it isn't, the burbling soundtrack delivered is so much more interesting, so much more mini, which is an important part of the cheeky, involving driving experience upon which this car's appeal stands or falls. Yes, people love the styling and the image, but one of these just has to put a smile on your face when you drive it. If the overall feeling you're gonna get is of just another super mini wearing a cute suit, you'd have to question this car's place in the overall scheme of things. I'd worried about this before driving it. The mini marketing people continually talk about go-kart handling, but that seems to be at odds with this Mark III model's longer wheelbase and wider track. On top of that, until now, you had front-driven minis and rear-driven BMWs, so minis were different and technically unique. But since Munich awoke to the benefits of the front-driven layout, that's no longer true. So now that this model shares the same so-called UKL platform and basically the same engines as a volume BMW model, uh, the 2 Series Active Tourer, will it lose a bit of its unique mininess? Well, the answer is no, not really. Driving this car still delivers the same infectious naughtiness that loyal owners love so much. 
there's still the same darty steering, the same quick fire throttle. And yes, in this version at least, still the same unyieldingly bumpy ride over poor surfaces. Fortunately, this time round, you don't have to have it. In fact, one of the most appealing things about this Mark III Mini is the way the newfound suppleness of its redesigned chassis makes this car a happier, long-journeying companion. That's something further aided by the much improved levels of refinement that are such a feature of this third generation model. Mini reckons it's up to four decibels quieter than its predecessor. Indeed, in most guises, this is now one of the few small cars in this fashion conscious class that really are comfortable venturing further afield. It's only when you go for the sportiest two litre turbo models like the Cooper S uh, that I've got here that the ride firmness takes a turn towards the old days with a setup that's great when you're giving the car a good vlogging but tedious the rest of the time when you're stuck with suspension settings that give you all the compliance of a Halfords trolley jack. Even here though, help is at hand, thanks to a box I think Cooper S owners really need to tick if they're likely to be using their cars for more than a bit of weekend fun. Namely, that for the, sadly optional, variable damper control setup. Now this enables you to switch the ride to suit the mood you're in and the road you're on works through the mini driving mode system you get as part of the also optional chili pack. Here a rather hidden selector at the base of the gear stick enables you to choose settings that tweak throttle, steering and on automatic models gear change response between mid and green settings for efficient comfort orientated motoring. And sport for when the road opens up and the red mist begins to fall, something echoed appropriately by a red glow around the central display, and less subtly by a little picture of a go-kart and the phrase, maximum go-kart feel, quite. You certainly get that with the unyielding day-to-day -day ride of this Cooper S if you don't pay extra to add the variable damper control package into the mini driving mode system. Check out the more supply suspended models further down the range though, and this additional feature may not be necessary. Try before you decide is my advice. Many commentators have talked about the sweet spot in the range being represented by the best-selling 1.5 litre petrol powered Cooper model, which makes 62 miles an hour in just 7.2 seconds en route to 130 miles an hour. To go quicker than this, you have to get your Mini with much firmer suspension and a much larger 2.0-litre three-cylinder engine up front, either the 192 brake horsepower unit I've got in this Cooper S, or the same engine tuned up to around 215 brake horsepower in the more extreme John Cooper Works version. Either way, the performance gains over the standard 1.5-litre Cooper model with its much friendlier ride and handling balance aren't massive. This Cooper S manages 62 miles an hour in 6.8 seconds on the way to 146 miles an hour. Still, that's enough to punt it into contention with super mini hot hatch benchmarks like Ford's Fiesta ST, Peugeot's 208 GTI and the Renault Sport Clio 200. Like the Fiesta and the Renault, the joy this Cooper S brings to driving when you're in the mood for it is in its place as one of those cars that feels faster than it actually is. A very good thing in my book. To better get you through the twisty stuff, there's a performance control system which electronically duplicates the kind of functionality you'd normally get from a heavier, more complicated mechanical locking differential. So it works through the turns to counter both understeer and wheel spin by lightly micro-braking whichever front wheel is threatening to lose grip. Now, as a result, the car's kept planted through the tightest corner and you're fired on from bend to bend. Oh, and on the subject of brakes, they're really very good indeed, as befits a potential track day car, large and extremely effective. Brilliant. The S really is a very fast car these days. Slotted into fourth gear at a pedestrian 30 miles an hour, then floor the throttle and it'll arrive at 70 miles an hour quicker than a 280 brake horsepower worth of Vauxhall Astra VXR. But even lesser minis have plenty to offer the owner who likes his or her driving. 
I've already talked about the way you can tailor the steering and suspension to your taste and the six-speed gear change too is a huge improvement on the bulky old box of the previous generation model. Not only because the throw is shorter, the redesigned stick's nicer to use and the stickety action's more satisfying, but also thanks to clever gearbox software that even instructs the engine to blip the throttle on the down chain so that it sounds as if you've mastered the perfect heel and toe technique and your friends will think you're the next Lewis Hamilton. If you can't be bothered with uh, all of that, then there are two six-speed auto transmission options on offer. The more desirable sport setup featuring shorter shift times and uh, steering wheel paddle shifters. It's hard to think of another car on sale today whose sales are influenced quite as directly by the way it looks as this one. Given that aesthetically the worst mistake any freshly designed Mini can make is to lose its mininess, the job of reinterpreting this car for a fresh generation of buyers must be a thankless one. Has it been successfully carried through here? Well, inevitably not everyone thinks so. The need for things like a higher bonnet line to meet updated pedestrian safety legislation is one of the reasons why it's certainly not as cute, either as the original Isigonis design or the earliest turn-of-the-century Frank Stevenson-styled BMW version. But that said, there's quite enough brand DNA here to make this car as instantly recognisable as anything on the road. The reason why is that all the visual cues you'd expect to see have been perfectly preserved in the move to modernity. The circular headlights now with lovely optional LED rings, the clamshell bonnet, the upright windscreen, the blacked out pillars that create the floating roof and the continuous band of chrome at the base of the glass house. All of it's present and correct. This Cooper S version even has the potent bonnet scoop of its predecessors. Though many will quietly admit that this styling flourish hasn't been functional since the old supercharged car bit the dust in 2006. Just think of it as a way of telling the flagship models apart from the rest at a glance. Here we're looking at the three-door hatch version with its rather oversized rear lamp clusters. Mini has also spun both five-door and Clubman estate body styles off this third-generation F56 platform for those needing a bit more space. It's possible you may not need them. This Mark III model is, after all, a fair bit bigger than its Mark II R56 predecessor, a car which still had its roots in the Munich maker's original 2001 R50 Mini. It's 44mm wider and 7mm taller than before, and 98mm longer too, though unfortunately most of that length gain has been swallowed up by the lengthier front overhang needed to meet the tougher pedestrian impact standards I mentioned earlier. Still, a 28mm longer wheelbase means that the passenger compartment should still be usefully bigger than before. Let's pull open the wider doors and have a look. Access to the rear is certainly easier than it was previously and once you get there you'll find that the cabin has gained some much needed head and legroom. There's more room for shoulders too, though still not enough to make it feasible for Mini to fit more than a couple of seat belts on this rear bench. Uh, no, despite the welcome reclining function for the backrest, you still wouldn't want to be stuck here for a long journey. But yes, it is a big improvement and kids will be more than happy. Nor, if the front seats are already in use, do you now have to restrict offers of a lift home to people you don't like very much. One six-footer could here sit behind another with genuinely passable comfort. So at last, this Mini can be seen for short trips at least as a genuine four-seater rather than a two plus two. That's a big change over what went before. As is the boot capacity, the aspect that more than any other Mini owners have previously most moaned about. You now get one of those clever movable floors that can be set at two separate heights though the downside of that is the lack 
of a proper spare wheel. Plus, the room available has increased by more than 30% to 211 litres. OK, so that's still not what you call huge, and it's still miles behind what you get in a more practically shaped trendy rival like a Volkswagen Beetle or a Citroen DS3, let alone an ordinary Fiesta-sized Supermini. But the changes made here have at least now elevated this space beyond the point-and-laugh category. It's certainly a lot bigger than you'd get in a rival Fiat 500, and not too far off the kind of room delivered by potential competitors like Alfa Romeo's Mito and Nissan's Duke. In fact, there's actually more room than you get in either of these two models if uh, you push forward the rear bench. Plus, it helps that the angle of the backrest can be altered and that uh, it now splits 60-40 rather than 50-50, which makes it easier to get awkwardly shaped items like pushchairs in. Now, with everything flat, uh, a surprisingly large 731 litre low capacity reveals itself. But you don't buy this car for its practicality. Or if you do, then you don't buy this three-door hatch version anyway. No, what you probably want is a more mature interpretation of mininess, which this Mark III model perfectly delivers. It's easy to forget quite how flimsy a lot of the fittings on the early BMW Minis were. Remember those indicator stalks that felt like snapping biros? Or the second generation car's feeble little plastic joystick that was used to enter sat-nav instructions? Everything feels a good deal more substantial in this car, a good deal more grown up. To that end, you get much more supportive seats with a wider adjustment range and a base lengthened by 23 millimeters for additional comfort and support. There's a proper rotary controller for the lights, electric uh, window switches relocated to the doors where everyone else puts them, more interior stowage space with two glove boxes and additional cup holders and space in the seat backs and front passenger footwell for the storage of bottles and maps. Oh, and a whole series of lovely touches, like the way the start-stop tab features heartbeat illumination, which pulses before the engine started, or the LED perimeter lights of the central display that progressively light up the perimeter of the screen as you switch driving modes, engage the engine stop-start, cope with parking, or count down to your next sat-nav turn-off. That huge display no longer functions as a speedo. Less characterfully, but more practically, that's been relocated to a pod in front of the steering wheel where it's flanked with a crescent moon rev counter and fuel gauge. All of this has freed this central area up for much more infotechnical trickery, marshalled via optional 5.5 or 8.8 inch multifunction colour displays you'll want to try and pay extra for, since the alternative is a cheapskate looking four line TFT readout. Though crying out for touchscreen functionality, the colour layouts are actually marshalled by this classy, effective iDrive style controller down by the thankfully conventional handbrake. And there are all the usual mini optional lifestyle touches like interior mood lighting that changes through all the colours of the rainbow. You'll need to allow a budget of around £19,000 for your Cooper S, so around £1,000 more than a Ford Fiesta ST or a Fiat 500 or Bath 595, but about the same as you'd pay for other key rivals like the Peugeot 208 GTI and the Renault Sport Clio 200 EDC. That's appropriate pricing. The previous generation Cooper S wasn't really a car you'd mention in the same breath as accomplished hot hatches of this sort. This one, though, is very much up to the task of addressing them head on, even if you don't buy into the whole concept of mininess. So, what's included for the money being asked here? Well, for this kind of cash, you'd expect the basics. Things like 16-inch alloys, front fog lamps, air conditioning, Bluetooth, and a DAB stereo. Beyond that, Mini throw in a lovely bonnet scoop, a set of chrome-finished exhaust pipes, a chrome-plated honeycomb radiator grille, and a three-spoke sport leather steering wheel. Paying extra for the 
chili pack means that your car will come with the mini driving mode system that enables you to select between mid, sport or green settings depending on how efficient you want your journey to be. And beyond that, well, I'd suggest that driving mode system to be incomplete without adding variable damper control to it for a few hundred pounds more so that you can tweak the ride quality as well as the steering throttle in gear change response. Elsewhere on the options list, I shouldn't listen to the optional Harman Kardon stereo if you're someone easily parted from your money. Most will also go for the lovely LED headlamps. And if you want to go even further, you can splash out on things like a panoramic glass roof, roof rails, windscreen heating, and a park distance control system that'll even better guide you into the tighter spaces if you also go for the rear parking camera. Maybe you'll also want the head-up display that's found on a little panel that rises at the base of the windscreen. Talking of displays, many Mini motorists will certainly be minded to make the most of the cabin's iconic central screen. Now that it no longer serves as a speedometer, it seems rather underutilised, with a dinner plate-sized display showing nothing more than a four-line TFT readout in standard models. Fill it with the optional 5.5 or 8.8 inch colour screen controlled by one of the centre console based iDrive style mini controllers and it's all very different. This shows a wide range of vehicle functions, some of these better illustrated by a pretty ring of LED lights that progressively light up the perimeter of the screen and can help with anything from parking manoeuvres to a change in your driving mode or the distance before your next sat nav turn off. More expected elements to be found on this main display include infotainment, navigation and the various mini connected services that come packaged up either in standard form or in the more advanced mini connected XL guys that I have here. These systems allow you to seamlessly integrate smartphones, so enabling the use of internet based services for entertainment, communication and driver information. There's networked navigation and real-time traffic information too, thanks to the XL package's clever JourneyMate function. Mini Connected is also the way into online-based services, such as web radio and the use of social networks like Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare and Glimpse. It's also the way you'll be receiving RSS news feeds and entertainment features, such as Deezer, Napster and TuneIn. On to safety and a level of possible provision that seems an awful long way from model founder Alec Isagonis' original thoughts on the subject back in the 60s. Asked about the crashworthiness of the Mini, he said, I make my cars with such good brakes and such good steering that if people get into a crash, it's their own fault. Thankfully, things have progressed a bit in the safety department since then. There are anti-lock brakes, of course, with electronic brake force distribution to make them more effective and cornering brake control to help you through the turns. So you're always primed for a swift stop. There's tyre pressure monitoring, fading brake support and a clever brake drying function that will imperceptibly dab the discs in wet weather to keep them dry. There's also the usual stability control system and a DTC dynamic traction control setup that in poor conditions allows a bit of controlled slip at the drive wheels so moving away on loose sand or deep snow can be a little smoother. If all of that isn't enough to prevent you having an accident then Isofix child seat fastenings, a pedestrian friendly bonnet and twin front side and curtain airbags will all be welcome features. In going further, your first option is to tick the box for the driving assistant pack that I have here, based around a camera operated cruise control and distance control function that's there to automatically maintain a predetermined distance to the vehicle ahead. It'll also dip your high beam for you at night and display road signs on the dash as you pass them. Best of all, a clever collision and pedestrian warning system is included that scans the road ahead for potential accident hazards. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Another smart idea is the optional eCall Intelligent Emergency Calling System. 
In the event of an accident, this setup automatically detects vehicle location and accident severity before contacting a call centre to initiate fast and effective assistance. That could be a lifesaver. I suspect, though, the good Sir Alec would have hated it. Now, you may think that increasing the size of the engine in this Cooper S from 1.6 to 2 litres is a strange move if part of the object is to improve efficiency. But remember that the cylinder count has fallen from 4 to 3, plus this car is a useful 10 kilograms lighter than before. As a result, owners can expect 49.6 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 133 grams per kilometre of CO2. That's class leading, about 10% better than you get from rivals like the Renault Sport Clio and Fiat's 500 at Bath 595, and about 5% better than direct competitors like Ford's Fiesta ST and Peugeot's 208 GTI. As you'd expect, there are a whole host of what the brand calls minimalism technologies that help this car achieve such good efficiency. These include the basics that these days you might expect. Slippery aerodynamics, uh, brake energy regeneration, the reduction of engine and transmission internal frictional losses, and ancillary engine systems that operate only when called upon rather than constantly pumping away in the background. Plus, of course, a stop-start system to cut the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Automatic models can also work with the mini navigational system to take account of your selected route and better control your gear shifts to suit. To further build on that approach, the driver can better play his or her part with a couple of optional systems that should further help to drive your running costs down. First up is the mini driving mode system that I have here. It operates via use of this rotary switch at the base of the gear stick, allowing you to switch from a default mid mode to self-explanatory sport or green settings. Now green mode modifies the throttle and transmission response and tweaks the standard gear shift point display. It also includes a so-called coasting function where at high cruising speeds the drivetrain is temporarily decoupled for extra frugality when you come off the accelerator. The onboard computer includes two readouts which demonstrate the effect of the fuel savings all this creates. One that shows the extra mileage available and another that shows the reduced energy consumption. Finally, there's the minimalism analyzer you can add as part of the mini connected package there to score your driving and guide you towards more economic progress. It might initially seem to be a bit of a gimmick, but owners who've used it reckon on fuel economy improvements of between four and eight miles to the gallon. What else? Well, residual values are bound to be strong, as even the old second generation model's three year attention figures were well above the class average. That'll also be helped by the way that Mini reliability improves with each generation, something evidenced by falling warranty claims. As expected, there's the usual three-year unlimited mileage warranty with the usual BMW-style variable service indicators. And on that subject, almost all Mini buyers opt for the no-brainer TLC package, which for around £300 gives you comprehensive servicing cover for five years or 50,000 miles, whichever is reached first. This also includes a Mini MOT Protect Assurance Guarantee, stating that in the unlikely event your car should fail its first, second or third MOT test, Mini will cover the cost of repair or replacement on an array of selected parts. Finally, I should mention insurance groups. You're talking Group 13 for the Mini 1D, Group 14 for the Mini 1, Group 17 for the Cooper D, Group 20 for the Cooper. This Cooper S is Group 28. We can all argue about whether this generation Cooper S is as pretty a car as its predecessor, but there can be no doubt that it's a better all-rounder. It's more spacious, better built, features some fascinating technical details and seems to have been engineered to offer more driving fun on one hand and lower bills on the other. Just make sure you spec your car right. You'll need to pay extra for the driving mode system and the variable damping, 
but avoid being tempted by larger wheels that bring a crashy ride and automatic gearboxes that detract from the connected feel. Yes, you could pay the same kind of money and buy a more conventional super mini based hot hatch. Perhaps the purer, more focused Fiesta ST or the more comfortable and relaxing Peugeot 208 GTI. This Cooper S though arguably delivers an appealing compromise between the two and feels much more special while it's doing it. It's a mini to the max and that's always